ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನತಿಮಿರಂದ್ಯಾನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಕಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮಿಧ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮಃ and all these people came early i mean on time <laughs> so i want to make sure to honor them hello everyone uh, thank you for joining us today Uh, we are a group of conscious living at salesforce and we have monthly series with uh, vishishika das um, it's a great joy and honor to welcome him back at salesforce uh, for our monthly series <coughs> we were just at the other session uh, today for an offsite event and we real i mean in the introduction we realized how conscious living has completed uh, 2.5 years uh, so it's it's all possible because of you coming and joining us um for those who are new uh, vishishika das is a veteran monk author and spiritual guide travels through the world sharing knowledge gra- gained from four decades of uh, bhakti yoga practice and dedication to spiritual entrepreneurialism uh, he speaks at various corporations universities and non profits teaching universal principles of personal spiritual development renowned for his wisdom and inspiring speech he has a way of making ancient yoga wisdom and practices uh, relevant and accessible um for today's topic um uh, to transcend the troubles of mind by uh, mantra meditation we'll hear more from him so let's welcome uh, vishishika das thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you it's nice to have a little time and space just to look in inwardly and find one's own consciousness <clears throat> and it's so close at hand yet often i'm distracted because i'm looking outwardly and i'm seeing my life situation and absorbed in my life situation so much that i may overlook my life and this is a distinction that is made very clearly in the wisdom literatures that talk about the practice of yoga and that is that the body which includes the gross physical body and also my psychological body which is described in the divisions of the mind and the intellect which are called two distinct entities and have various functions but they're the subtle body and then there's the gross physical body much like we have hardware and then we have software the that uh, tells the hardware what what to do i hope that was i said that in the, the right way but beyond that there is the person who's operating it and that would be what is called the atma that is the what is called the knower of the field so the hardware and the software would be known as the field and this body is called the kshetra and the knower of the field is called kshetra gya gya means to know it's cognate in english with uh the word no gya or gyana uh has transferred into the english language from sanskrit to the word knowledge and so there is a a difference uh distinction made right, rather bet- uh, between the knower of the field and the field itself and taking time to introspect and look within oneself and to notice that you're the noticer you're noticing how your body's working moving and you can also observe your mind the psychological body and see how it is moving and working and the logic is this because you're able to notice it and you're the observer you can objectify the body you can also objectify the mind and your thoughts therefore you're not your body and you're not your mind you're actually something that is transcendent to the body and the mind and a simple observation of the of that fact is a very profound kind of meditation or actually we call it communion with your own self seeing yourself by observing uh, who you are 
and how your consciousness is uh, radiant and self-effulgent is extremely refreshing to say the least and also gives kind of perspective to that gives one uh, much more efficiency in working within the practical world around us when I'm thinking that I am my life situation and I'm simply reacting to it from moment to moment I may find myself overwhelmed is that possible mm -hmm. at any given time during the day week month or year that I might feel overwhelmed by the circumstances or the situations in my life a few people yes everyone's saying yes now yeah so that's very possible and oftentimes it's compared to watching a movie when you tune into the movie you sit down and the screen comes on or the light hits the screen and then you become absorbed in what you're watching so much so that you might be carried away by the movie possible what movie carried you away what is it ever, ever. everyone <laughs> have you ever cried in a movie yeah, yeah. have you ever uh, you know just been so happy that um, you know you sprung out of the movie theater so uh, the the movie is like our life situation it's going on it can we can identify with it and think of ourselves as going through something happy something that's sad loss gain so forth however when the light comes on we notice actually we're the observer of the movie we have our own independent life we'll notice that I'm different from the movie so in the process of introspection also called meditation there's a way in which I can very easily observe that I'm not my body and I'm not my psychological body either which is the mind and the intellect and doing that is very helpful because it gives us a kind of perspective through which uh, we don't uh, overreact to the life situation that's going on around us it gives us a kind of peace so since uh, <coughs> we've um, gathered now and uh, we're sort of settled and I've given a slight preamble maybe we can do a, a little bit of a meditation and try it for ourselves and the uh, I'll do a guided uh, meditation and the objective of this is just um, you don't have to try too hard um, but just be observant and uh, that's what that what we're good at because we're units of attention we are conscious beings and therefore just be conscious that you're conscious and try to be aware of your own awareness does that make any sense be aware of your own awareness that's all you have to do you don't have to overextend yourself or imagine anything so I'm gonna just walk us through for a few minutes a kind of meditation that is actually from the yoga teachings and I'll walk us through um, step by step and you can just follow my voice and uh, feel what it feels like to take a few minutes to look inwardly. I know many of you do this regularly anyway, but it should be an ever fresh experience. So if you'll take a, um, a comfortable position in your seats and then just uh, sit up just a slight bit straighter than you were a minute before. Because when you sit up straight, you'll find that your, your mental system comes to a more attentive state and close your eyes and focus on your breathing just notice that you have breath and it's really fortunate that you do and it's a real gift appreciate that you have oxygen coming in invigorating your body in order to be more aware of your breath mentally say in when you inhale and mentally say out when you exhale and just try to bring your mind to one point on your breathing
now. You're walking on a soft golden brown pathway with a tangle of green trees and flowers on either side. At the end of the pathway is a yellow door. As you push the door open, you're greeted by an expanse of soothing light. The light envelops you and you feel warm and safe. You've entered your inner world, the place in which you can taste the nectar of your own consciousness. Close the door to the outside world behind you and be fully present. Remain unattached from any thoughts. Observe them, but don't engage them. Be a dispassionate witness with no need or responsibility to react. Now take an experiment and notice how you can direct your attention to any part of the body that you wish. Move it from your breath to your right hand. And notice that your right hand is also illuminated by the consciousness coming from yourself. Now move your attention to your left foot. You can feel your foot in this moment. Notice the sensation and notice that you're the director of your own attention. You can place it wherever you wish. Bring your awareness to the region of the heart and feel positively that you exist. Notice that you're the one who can look at your hand, your foot, or can move your attention back to your heart. But you are separate from the things that you're seeing. The seer and the seen are different. Feel that you are not the body. See your thoughts and feel that you are not your thoughts. They're energy like clouds moving through the sky of your mind. You're simply watching them pass by as energy, but you are different from them. Now notice and become aware that you have the power to hear. You have the power to touch, to see, to taste and smell, to walk, to speak, and to digest. All these are inexplicable powers invested in you. Now become aware of your intelligence. Notice it 
and remember how it's giving you directions like those given from an unseen expert who is always with you and available even when you sleep. The Yoga Sutras call this benevolent guide the Super Self. And now, absorbed in your own consciousness, we'll repeat the mantra Om three times. The yoga scriptures say that the vibration Om is already there within the heart, and when you repeat it with your vocal cords, you can resonate with that Om that's within the region of your heart chakra. So I'll begin saying the mantra and you can follow along and vibrate at the same time. Oh. Just take a moment to feel how that sound vibration resonated within your mind and your heart. You can move your fingers, your toes, move your arms a little bit, open your eyes back into the room. Welcome back. So this is a, a simple process of introspection or meditation through which one can become aware. Oftentimes, as I mentioned, I can go a whole day without thinking about the fact that I'm an observer. I may just be moving from one project to the next, one demand of my senses to the next. And do you think it's possible to go through a whole day without becoming aware that I'm the one who's witnessing all these things? How about, is it possible to go through a whole week? Possible? How about a month? How about one year? possible? How about 10 years? How about 100 years? It's possible. There's an old saying, an unexamined life is not worth living. And what is it about the life that we're observing? So the consciousness is endlessly fascinating. And the ways that the yoga scriptures talk about the process of overcoming the troubles of the mind, it starts with describing how the mind is like a horse. And when you train the horse, then it can become very uh, friendly and useful. And there can be a great relationship. And if you don't train the horse, then you can have, if you try to ride the horse, you'll have a wild ride. So different ways described in yoga to help to train the mind so it becomes a friend. I mean, you can imagine if you're living with an enemy and for instance, you're right next to an enemy state and they're always sending all kinds of um, internet robots in to disturb you and um, there's an adversarial kind of relationship. 
you're always on guard and always disturbed. So the Bhagavad Gita says the mind can be like that also, unless it's trained properly. And here are a couple of ways in which you'll notice on the back of your card, looking at the mistakes of the mind, that the yoga scriptures describe the ways that the mind becomes what's called a binibeshita, or absorbed in the life situation, and then it becomes out of control. So one of them is to consider impermanent things to be permanent. So the impermanent in Sanskrit is called asat. So sat actually means that which exists. And it's always there. It's, it's stable and permanent. And when you put an A in Sanskrit in front of this word, it reverses the meaning. So asat means it's illusory, it's, it's wispy, it's not substantial, it's constantly moving. And then there's the second word that goes with this, is called trishna. Could you try pronouncing this? Trishna. With the dot underneath it, and, and uh, when we're um, translating in English, it makes an sh sound. So trishna means thirst. So this is uh, one of the defects of the mind. It's called asat trishna, or a thirst for that which is temporary. And this is said to be the source of misery for the mind, because the things that are asat, they're described as being adyantavanta, they have a beginning and an end. And therefore, when I concentrate on them, and I try to enjoy them, then my consciousness uh, eventually contracts. I have them and then I lose them. And this is a very frustrating experience f for those who are observing the world and becoming attached to it and trying to hold on to various things that can't be held on to. They're constantly changing and moving. And therefore there's a kind of um, unhappy feeling that, that comes about through maintaining this thirst for things that are asat or temporary. And the next is uh, becoming absorbed in the impermanent. And I described that just a minute ago with the word abhinibeshita. It means I can become so absorbed in all the things that are not permanent that that's all I think about all the time. Not the least of which is actually the body and mind itself. The body and the mind are temporary. They're always changing. And when I try to identify with them as myself, then I feel uh, a kind of uneasiness. And that's because it doesn't last. It's constantly moving. The, mo the body is described sometimes to be like a river. If you step foot in the Russian River, you know where that is? And then you come back and you step foot in it 10 minutes later. Did you step in the same river? What is your answer? No? Why? Do you have a microphone for him? Why? It's the Russian River. I just stepped in it 10 minutes ago. I just stepped in it again. It's not the same. Because the river is flowing. Yeah. Can you be more, uh, can you elaborate? The, the water is not the same. Okay. Now, if you were going to uh, follow my line of reasoning when it comes to the body, how would you see the two things as parallel. What parallels are there between, just on a very basic um, level, of between my body and the Russian River? What things would you say? Just like the Russian River, our bodies are ever-changing. We age, yeah. naturally. And so, um, you know, connecting this back to mindfulness, I think, we oftentimes might be critical or judge ourselves for an outwardly appearance based on what your body looks like when really we're focusing on impermanence as a as a permanent form and or bodies as an as a permanent form when re in reality they're always changing so there's no need to resist that process brilliant and i think what you brought out there was really important about trying to get the body to look a certain way. Is there ever a time when 
the body looks exactly the way you want it to look? <laughs> There's always something that's out of place. Uh, the perpetual endeavor to get the body to cooperate and look just the way we want it to is, can, can be onerous. Because as you so eloquently pointed out, it's always changing. What is a, a very basic parallel between this body and the Russian River, just on a physical level, as far as uh, its makeup, its physical makeup? Water. How? What degree? What percentage of uh, this body is made of water? Seventy percent or so. That's a lot. <laughs> it's really mostly water. So in this way, uh, you know, just on a very basic level, you could say this body and the Russian River have a lot in common. I mean, there's some rocks and stones in the river too, so that could make up for maybe thirty percent, and the other is water. So this body is constantly changing, also. In fact, I might say there's there's a river of fluid going through this arm right now. It's moving at a, a very high um, speed, uh, constantly changing. And so what the Vedic uh, uh, wisdom literatures are saying really is uh, be a little observant and notice what your body is. Just don't take it for granted that I am my body because you're the observer of the body. You are riding or living within the body, but you're not the body. And so being absorbed in thinking I'm the body in all different ways and trying to uh, maintain the body, not that... Uh, yoga wi wisdom says don't maintain the body. It says you should, but don't be overly absorbed and think that the body is you. And then the third part of the mistakes of the mind is seeing things as mine. So if you were to define something that uh, you would say is um, <clears throat> what would be the definition of something that you actually own that you could claim to be yours? And you could say this is mine. If you kind of give a legalistic kind of definition of something that's yours, quintessentially. Legal document. Their legal document that says what? That dictates ownership of a... What does it mean to be uh, the owner? It means you... Here's what I'm getting at. You get to keep it, right? Okay. Like it's your thing, you get to keep. But let me just suggest something or bring up the question. What is it that any of any of the things that you have right now that you actually get to keep? Who said nothing? You said nothing. Okay. So nothing includes what? Body. Is that a phone? Do you get to keep that? I mean, momentarily. Yeah. Momentarily. Okay. <laughs> what other things might you have that, that you get to keep for a little while? The experiences last for longer, maybe, the, the, at the mental and intellect level. Okay. Right. But uh, it's, it's... But just our physical things in our environment. Car, I'll name a few. You tell me if you get to keep them permanently. Car? No. House? No. Uh, country? No. Sports team? I mean, they could change cities at any time, right? <laughs> like, wait a minute, that was my sports team. You know, and people identify even with their sports team. They say, you know, we won. And it's like, you won? Did you play? And I didn't play. I just identified and I said, this is my team. So this idea of mine, there is an I. And we tried to look at what is the I. It is me, the conscious observer of the world. But then I project myself into all kinds of things around me and I say, they are mine. So the I turns into mine. But the real definition ultimately of mine is that I get to keep it. But if you'll notice that you don't get to keep anything, then um, you'll see one of the mistakes of the mind, which is to attach onto things and say, this is mine. And again, it doesn't mean that you don't become a good steward of the things that you have already. You have to live a balanced life. You have responsibilities. But it's the, the attitude and the perception that changes to say that, yes, I have these things, but I'm using them temporarily. And they're not mine to keep, in f including this body. This is a shocking uh, assertion. You don't get to keep the body. Is that okay to say that? Yep. Did you get a, um, 
a lease agreement at least <laughs> that says how long you get to keep it like when you get an apartment you know they you said legal document so then it says on the legal document of the lease it says you know you get to you get to stay here as long as you pay for <laughs> for the next year right so where do you all have your uh, lease agreement for this body it's in the car right you have it in a safety deposit box somewhere <laughs> did anybody sign it birth certificate yeah there isn't a guarantee and so <laughs> the idea that I become absorbed in that which doesn't really have a permanent existence and I act like it does this is called the Bini Beshita, and it's a cause of contracting the consciousness and it's the actual root of anxiety it's where fear arises when I irrationally connect myself to things that aren't mine uh, because I don't get to keep them they're only in my stewardship for some time and that they're temporary and I try to pretend that they're gonna last forever that causes uh, great anxiety so the next uh, ways to train the mind practice concentrating on one point this is called Vyavasayatmika Bhuti the, the intelligence or the intellect can be directed in one place. Otherwise, if there's no practice in that, then the, the mind becomes what's called bahushaka, many branched. It can go in many different directions at, at one time. And it causes a kind of uh, disturbance. But the, the ability to actually focus and to look inwardly and see oneself, or even to look externally and to concentrate on one thing at a time, is a great practice for peace of mind, what to speak of efficiency. The next is called introspection, to observe your own consciousness, which is what we just did. That exercise was really designed and taken from one of the Vedic writings to show us how to walk through and take an inventory. Am I my hand? Am I my hand? What do you think? No. no. I know, man. Even the language that I'm using suggests I'm not, because if I was my hand, I would say I hand. But I don't say I hand. I say my hand, because it's one of my things. It cooperates with me, hopefully. <laughs> so, uh, taking the time to observe. And <clears throat> the next is to deliberate on the temporary nature of things in general. So, if I'm accustomed to uh, deliberation, in other words, I, I'm looking at the world and observing and seeing how it's moving and noticing that I'm the one observing it and noticing the difference between the two. Me as the observer and the world as the moving energy around me. My life and my life situation are different. When I have that kind of perspective, then I'm uh, what's called nishta or I'm I have an actual place to stand. Uh, the word nishta, which means steady or solid, in Sanskrit is cognate in English with the word stand, shta and stand. It comes from the Sanskrit, the word stand, nishta. So <clears throat> this is uh, a practice of consciousness, of awareness, of seeing who I am and being uh, conscious of it. Is there enough air in here for everybody, or is there a possibility to get more air? I'm just noticing that there may be a slight decrease in oxygen in here. Is it? Okay. Now, here are some practices that are um, completely doable, even here in the Bay Area, wherever you may live. And one of them is uh, mantra meditation. So, mantra. This is a dual word. Man means mind. And tra means to expand. So, why would it be important to expand the consciousness? And this is a principle you'll find again and again throughout the yoga teachings, is this simple concept. When the consciousness 
or what's called the chitta, and that is the combination of the mind the, and the intelligence. When it expands, when it becomes bigger, then you'll feel peace. Here's the reason. If you put a, a restless fish in a small bowl, it will thrash and it will make a disturbance. It will kick water out of the, the bowl and you'll notice the turbulence. However, if you put that same fish into a big lake, then you will hardly notice it at all. In the same way, all the time we have impressions coming into our mind through our senses. However, when our consciousness is expansive, and it can expand through various practices, including mantra, to expand the mind, then we don't notice, or we're not disturbed by the various impressions that come within the mental system. However, when our chitta, our consciousness, contracts, then every little thing that happens to us is disturbing because we're living in a small space. So here's a very interesting phenomena. Here's two words. This word is pronounced sukha. Could everyone please say that? Sukha. sukha. And it's a Sanskrit word which means happy. Okay, and here's the opposite word. Can you see that? That's pronounced dukkha, everyone say. Dukkha. Everyone from India is smiling because they know all these words because they're same in Hindi. Okay, so then this means distress. Okay, so let's break the words down and you'll see how it's related to the point I'm making about expansive or contracted consciousness. So, the word ka in Sanskrit means space. So, su means good or expansive. It means an expansive space or a good space. Have, it, have any of you ever said or heard somebody say, yeah, I'm in a good space right now? You think about it, what does it really mean? I'm in a good space. <laughs> well, we're getting to that. Now, duke, dukkha, ka again means space. Ka. It's an element, actually. It's mentioned in the Vedas. Bhumir apu analovayu ka mano burevicha. Ka means ether or space. Space is very important, actually. If you notice, if you've ever lost the uh, space key on your on your computer or it malfunctions and you start typing and all the words merge together you can't understand what's going on right the space between us the space between the words I'm saying and the space between the buildings here makes a big difference doesn't it and the kind of space that we create within our own consciousness determines whether we're sukha or dukkha it's the space that we create so the mantra the mantra it helps to create the expansiveness within one's own mind through the sound vibration, through the power of resonance. It's called acoustic resonance. Sound vibration is very powerful and it has a feature and it's called excitation. When you introduce sound vibration to any other object in this world, this, that particular object, everything vibrates in this world, it will pick up the from the spectrum of sound for what you're introducing it will pick up at its own level a kind of vibration and it will start vibrating also if I put two tuning forks next to each other and I hit one with a rubber mallet then the other one will pick up the energy from the first one and will also right before your eyes and to, to the what you'll notice by your ears is it starts to vibrate also so the mantra is a special kind of sound vibration that when you resonate it resonates with your higher uh, consciousness or your conscious self 
and it expands your consciousness and that's why when you do mantra meditation and you hear the sound then you feel for yourself that your consciousness is expanding and you're feeling what everyone say it which means good space I'm in a good space right now <laughs> and you might have heard the terms have you ever heard somebody called narrow-minded ever heard that how about someone was called broad-minded which one is uh, pejorative which one's better considered better somebody who's narrow-minded or broad-minded in the modern vernacular which is better broad-minded because they are su -ka. they're broad-minded and if you think about it somebody who's broad-minded what are the characteristics if you'd say you met somebody and said oh, they're broad-minded what would you say were their characteristics? Why would you call them broad-minded? Yes? They're open to experiences. They're open to experiences, yes? Okay. They're also not attached to any particular outcome. Yes, they're not attached to any particular outcome. And one of the reasons is because when you have sukha, when you, you have a little space and you're able to have perspective. You're not jammed in. Your consciousness is so crammed in here that every little thing uh, <clears throat> disturbs you. But you have space. Like, have you ever heard somebody say, I need my space? Like in a relationship? <laughs> yeah, I need to create a little sukha. Because uh, when you're too close, then you know, it's, it starts to disturb you. So one way or another, you have to create a little space. And when you have a little space, then you're not reactive to everything that happens. What other things would you say if somebody's broad-minded? Content. Yes. And this is one of the points. This is why this means happy. Because when the consciousness expands, that's when you feel happy. You, you actually feel serene peaceful. There's an example given in the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Krishna says that uh, the ocean has millions of rivers rushing into it every second, but it doesn't move. It stays the same because it's so expansive. So similarly, when the, when the mind, when the chitta is expanded through not just mantra meditation, but also described by dharma, by doing, uh, doing the right thing, there's many definitions to Dharma, but I just like to put it in that terms, do the right thing. The consciousness gets bigger and you feel naturally happy. So what do I mean by uh, doing the right thing? It's called Dharma. And so have you ever had an experience where you had a choice to do the right thing or do the wrong thing and it was right in front of your face and you did the right thing? Like maybe you had a choice to tell the truth or don't tell the truth and you told the truth has that ever happened i'll tell you a story that happened to me i i have this office chair that i sit in a lot to write and the ar i used it so much the arms wore out so i went down to this place uh, nearby where i live and they have all kinds of parts for chairs and they just happen to have the part for my chairs the two arms to replace it so the person who owned the store said, listen, I'm not sure if these are the same, but you take them home, you put them on. If they work, you come back and you pay me. So I went back, I put them on, they worked. And the next day I had to fly out and I had to go overseas and I was there for six weeks. And we came back, you know, they taught me in accounting when I studied, they said there's this principle called the law of diminishing intent especially in collections <laughs> so so you know time and goes by and it's thinking I'm really busy and a lot of time went by and I kept thinking I should go pay the person and finally you know even though I was busy I you know I took the money I drove down there and I walked in and he saw me and um, I could tell he was surprised I showed up actually because I didn't have to uh, he never would he didn't know me he didn't know how to contact me we didn't exchange numbers anything like that and i paid him and he said thank you very much and i turned around i was walking out and he he goes one thing thank you very much it was so much uh from his appreciation that i had come back and 
I could barely fit out the door if my consciousness was so expanded because I did the right thing. And this is called Dharma, or the principle, and you'll notice that actually the kinds of things that I, my mind, when it's not trained, thinks will make me happy, like attaching myself to more and more temporary things. If I just have one more thing, like retail therapy, it'll make me happy. It actually contracts the consciousness because I get it, and then I'm disturbed with it. Have you ever bought something that seemed like a good idea in the store, and then when you got it home, you thought, what did I get this for? Or somebody looks at it and he goes like, what'd you get that for? <laughs> That's horrible. You, it makes you look fat. <laughs> you know, whatever it is, it's always disappointing. But with Dharma, when you do the right thing, when you tell the truth, when you have com developed compassion or you show compassion to somebody else, you grow. Your consciousness becomes sukha and you feel happy. That's where real happiness comes from. It's cliche to say happiness comes from within, but this is why. This is why it happens. So when we resonate with the mantra, the sound, a uh, higher sound vibration, which is uh, expansive, it expands the consciousness. And when we do dharma, we do the right thing. We have a uh, right livelihood. We live in such a way that uh, we are moving in the world in a compassionate way or as compassionately as possible then uh, we, our consciousness expands and we begin to feel happy and we can overcome and transcend the troubles of the mind. So these are a few basic principles and why they work. And now I'll just take a few reflections or questions that you might have. Reflections just mean anything that you heard so far that's stuck in your mind. And a question means you'd like to bring out more of a particular thing. And we'll bring you the microphone within four seconds or less or your money back from this seminar. <laughs> yes, one, two. So something that really resonated with me was that happiness comes from within and I think um, prior to finding mindfulness practice, I did live my life in a way such that, um, you know, procuring or obtaining material items I thought would make me happy or successful or whatever that looked like. And it hasn't been until recently in which I have found meditation and accordingly have felt more connected to uh, who I am. Um, and happier because of that and so and like truly happy um, in a lot of ways like my truest essence feels pure and so i'm curious you know from your perspective over time like how do you stay within that state um, and have that become your steadfast versus you know the 10 or 20 minutes that i spend uh, meditating every day thank you for such a good question and for the testimonial really because that really helps hearing somebody's personal experience with this is um, compelling actually well on the front of the card where you see this kind of alarming picture of uh, mantra meditation uh, you see create your sacred space count your daily mantras and practice deliberate focus what you described about a 20-minute practice a day is is not at all insignificant because the, the spiritual practice, especially practicing mantra, has a, a systemic effect and it also has an indelible, makes an indelible impression. And of course, we do have our lives to attend to. Am I incorrect about that? You have a life situation that you have to attend to. It's not going to uh, wait for you to take a three month uh, retreat to us. Uh, just do meditation and and if your mind isn't used to that kind of thing it's very difficult to actually uh, detach yourself from the current state of affairs and just go do something else like try to be introspective therefore the yoga liter literatures talk a lot about karma yoga karma yoga means to do your work but do it with more intentionality and, and purposefulness 
Like, everyone has to do some work anyway by nature. That's called karma. Karma really is a concept of debt. And the idea is that when I live in this world, I live at the cost of others. I know this sounds a little extreme, but it's what the Vedas talk about. They say, jivo jiva sajivanam. In order for me to live, other people have to die. If I'm a vegetarian, which I am, uh, plants have to die for me to live. And that's just a fact. And it doesn't matter how gently you move in the environment, you're going to live at the cost of the lives of others. That's the nature of the world that creates karma. And karma is a kind of debt that I have to pay back. And when I exploit from the environment, or whenever I, whatever I take from this environment, is kind of like spending on a credit card. I get the thing, but then later on I have to pay back for it. That's called karma. So when I'm working in the world, uh, it's not that I can just walk away from it. So that's, that's not a, a reasonable suggestion for me to make, to say. But there is a, a way in which I start to do my work, but I do it with the idea that I'm doing it as service. And I find out ways to do it as service. Because service, especially when you're co connecting it to your original divine source, is not a reactive. It doesn't have the same effect that when I'm working just because I want to maintain myself or because I want to develop uh, wealth and be more comfortable. Uh, not that you can't be comfortable and not that you can't develop wealth, but if you utilize it for a higher purpose, then it becomes uh, transformed. And an example that my teacher used to give often was if you take an iron rod and you place it in a hot fire like a blacksmith's fire and you leave it in there long enough, the iron transforms into fire. So it's one element, but it transforms into a different element. So in the same way, all the things that I have in my life right now and all the patterns, the things that I'm doing, if I use them for a higher purpose, which is kind of like connecting them to the fire, it's a spiritual fire, then they become transformed also. And the other point is that a little bit goes a long way. If you start with a simple home practice of practicing mantra meditation and a little karma yoga, it also helps if, <clears throat> just like the CEO of this fine company, uh, it gives away a lot of, of what the company earns to good causes. And th this, was, this is intentional. This is a kind of an enlightened decision that he makes to do that. This is called karma yoga. It means that you're not just working for the sake of the bottom line, making money, but you make money, but you give at least a portion of it away to do service. And when you do that, it, it transforms what you're doing. So that's one way that everyone can actually engage in spiritual life in a practical way because you're going to have to work anyway. And the other way is what you're doing, uh, and adding in some very intentional, what's called sadhana. So I'll just mention that there are, there are five stages of consciousness listed in the uh, wisdom literature. And the first one is called covered consciousness. And that's like trees and, and plants. You know they're alive, right? But it's communicating with them is not really uh, noticeable so much. I mean, my mom used to, but... Um, then above covered consciousness is called contracted consciousness, like animals. They have basic emotions. They cry when they're young or taken away from them. They, uh, they feel pain. Uh, they're, you know, they can show happiness, sadness, and things like that, but they're, they're not um, contemplating C++ or um, any of the other <laughs> complex kinds of uh, operations that you're all doing. And I'm not sure exactly all that you're doing, but I know it's significant. Then above that is called budding consciousness, you know, like a tree budding. And that's uh, w in human life, there's this juncture where you have the opportunity to like uh, really grow spiritually. Above that is called blossoming consciousness. And blossoming consciousness takes place with humans with sadhana. So I'll just write the word sadhana.
Everyone can say sadhana. sadhana. And sadhana means to add, deliberately add a spiritual practice to your life every day. And it's those humans that are, uh, add sadhana to their normal life, they start to developing uh, um, blossoming consciousness. The consciousness starts to bloom. And how much? Whatever you can do according to your capacity, because everyone starts at a different level, even if you do one minute a day, uh, consistently over time, it'll have a significant effect. And actually expecting a lot more than that in the beginning may be unreasonable because the mind is very obstinate and difficult to control. <laughs> so it's like a wedge. A wedge you start with a tiny part of the, the, the wedge is, is paper, is, uh, paper thin and if you insert that into your life and apply a little bit of pressure through your discipline and continue it then it'll open a bigger and bigger space for you in your sadhana so there are different kinds of sadhana but the one that I advocate the most because it's the most advocated through the teachings of, of the um, modern yoga scriptures the ancient yoga scriptures and modern uh, is the uh, mantra meditation if you introduce that and you do that along with karma yoga, you'll find uh, um, that you'll, you'll, get, you'll have breakthrough experiences and you'll also find shift in your life. You'll, you'll shift the paradigm. Like you're talking about, you'll have a different perspective. You'll start to notice things in your own life. For instance, how your consciousness is expanded, how you're able to tolerate certain kinds of circumstances that you weren't able to tolerate before. This is a kind of superhuman uh, <laughs> ability to develop. Most people have a, a difficult time tolerating, for instance, if somebody cuts them off on the freeway. True or false? True? Okay. We may go down the list of things that are most I intensely difficult to, to tolerate, but uh, if you have a sadhana and uh, you practice karma yoga, then you'll notice that you become more tolerant. It's, you're starting to develop spiritual abilities. Why? Because your consciousness is expanding. You have more room. You're not disturbed by all these uh, various things that come into your life. Thank you. You got me really going there. Uh, we have a couple more minutes, so we'll take one or two more reflections. Yes? I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, so in the start of the session, you mentioned that uh, you need to also sometimes observe your mind. Uh, but how does one do that when, like, for example, when I'm working, I'm completely indulged in the work, and how can I come out of there to observe what I'm doing? Well, one thing is if you practice early in the morning and you start your day on the right foot, you'll notice that you have a lot more ability throughout the day to be focused and aware of the fact that you're not your mind. And especially if you, if you have that practice and you can have a little breakthrough, then that breakthrough experience will carry through through the whole day. So that's why a lot of people like to start with a little bit of practice early in the morning, especially before the sun comes up. You'll notice that. And also, uh, there's nothing to say that you can't keep the mantra going later. So um, we're going to end now right at 4 o'clock. However, um, if anyone wants to uh, stay after, I'm going to give a, uh, for those who haven't, uh, tried it before, a um, primer on mantra meditation. We're going to sit up here in a little circle. For those who are already familiar with it, it's just a little bit of momentum to keep your practice going. But there are about um, 20 or 30 people here at Salesforce that regularly meet with Manu at the meditation room when they're practicing mantra meditation on a regular basis and they're carrying it up to their home. So I'm officially ending the meeting to respect your time because you're very busy in, in many ways. And I want to thank you very much for giving your attention. And I also want to thank everyone who joined us online from various places around the, the Salesforce world, wherever you may be. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, I hope that you um, uh, were able to take away one or two principles from this and it makes your life better, easier, and happier. Thank you very much. Thank you. Not to the armor man, 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 hey!
Natchery Armarman, Natchery Armarman, Natchery Armarman, Natchery Armarman.